So, okay, uh, let us continue our discussion of uh, the Stokes drag uh, on a sphere uh, falling in a fluid. So, basically um, the goal of this exercise is to reach the point where we can uh, derive the classical formula that we have encountered in our school days, namely this one. Uh, um, so, this uh, equation 4.217. So, that is 6 pi eta u a. So, eta is the coefficient of viscosity of the fluid, u is the speed with which uh, the ball is falling and that ball has radius a. So, basically that is the drag experienced by the ball when it is falling with that speed in the fluid. So, that is what we want to derive, but then the derivation of that is not simple because it involves taking into account turbulence and uh, the fact that uh, there are these Reynolds numbers that are involved and you have to expand uh, in powers of Reynolds number. So, I do not want to spend too much time on the technical details because it is very easy to get lost. So, I will just highlight the salient features. So, the first feature was that uh, we have we expand uh, this this equation that means there is Navier Stokes uh, in the case of steady state there are no time dependencies. So, first we render that uh, dimensionless by rescaling the variables then uh, we expand all the unknowns whether it is pressure or velocity and so on in powers of this Reynolds number and uh, you will see that uh, the first order terms are uh, related to the second order terms and so on. So, uh, so the first order in a Reynolds number is related to the 0th order in the Reynolds number in this way. So, 4.182 will tell you how V1 dash which is the first order correction to the velocity of the fluid. So, I am I'm assuming that the ball is at rest and the fluid is flowing around that uh, ball which is the same as ball flowing in the fluid. So, whatever it is 4.182. 182 is the one that tells you how the fluid velocity will change uh, because of the Reynolds number. So, V1 dash is the first order correction to the velocity because of the obstacle. Okay, uh, point is that uh, so once we derive all this and then we take into account the fact that the um, uh, we are talking about incompressible fluid. So, in steady state uh, the uh, velocities are divergence free. So, that will mean that basically um, uh, this pressure and velocity and all that which satisfies uh, sp pressure especially satisfies the Laplace, uh, Laplace equation because uh, if you take divergence of 4.193 for example, you will get del squared p equals 0. Uh, so, then, then you uh, write down the um, del squared b equals 0 and then you can express the radial component in terms of the tangential component. And the tangential component is expanded in uh, linear combinations of these uh, Legendre polynomials and then uh, finally, uh, we will be able to write down one equation purely for the coefficients of uh, the um, that the coefficients that appear in this uh, radial function. So, you see this uh, uh, sorry the tangential component of the velocity is expressible in terms of these quantities. So, the basic po point is that you have to calculate these quantities. Once you know what these quantities are, you know V theta and because you know V theta from this formula, you will know V r. So, if you know this quantity, you will know V theta and V r. So, how do you calculate this quantity? You insert that into uh, these, uh, these equations uh, which are basically uh, uh, expanded out versions of 4.193. So, you take 4.193 and you expand it out. So, if you expand it out you will get. Uh, so, where does this come from? This comes from matching the Reynolds number on both sides. So, you expand in powers of Reynolds number and you substitute uh, into that Navier Stokes in steady state situation and you compare uh, the powers of Reynolds number and you get 4.193 from there. So, now that you have got this you go ahead and substitute your uh, expanded out forms for V1 dash in terms of the v, Vr V thetas and uh, therefore, the Vls. So, from the from this you can also del squared P is 0. So, from this you can find out the pressure also. Uh, so, it will have its own coefficients. Okay. 
So, when you uh, insert all this you will see you will get one equation which will only involve the uh, VL thetas. Okay. So, now 4.197 is uh, one thing it looks very horribly complicated, but you will see that uh, it is not complicated mainly because uh, it looks complicated, but it is finally not because uh, most of the terms in that uh, summation are actually 0 because uh, in fact only L equal to 1 survives because all the uh, see the thing is the P L cos thetas are uh, basically linearly independent basis. So, these these two being equal means that all the higher order derivatives of P L uh, cos theta have to vanish because uh, you do not find you know things to cancel that out uh, somewhere else. So, you will be able to convince yourself that because the higher derivatives of P L cos theta are linearly independent of the lower ones, the higher derivatives are going to drop out and specifically you can convince yourself that P L dash dash is identically 0. So, therefore, all the higher derivatives are identically 0. So, that means, uh, so if P L dash dash is 0 that means, uh, basically it is only up to L equal to 1. In fact, you will find that only L equal to 1 will survive. So, if you, uh, so, so what you do is you kind of first convince yourself that is that is in fact the case. Okay. So, this P 4.197 was obtained by inserting our answers uh, which uh, expands the velocity in, in terms of the um, complete uh, basis which is Legendre polynomials. So, once you substitute into 4.1, uh, uh, you substitute that answer into 4.197, you get an answer for that uh, the only relevant uh, coefficient which is V1 theta. So, so it is only this is the only relevant one. So, that means you remember that there was a VL in general it was like this. So, uh, where VL was uh, something very general. So, it could have been anything. So, L could be anywhere from 0 to infinity. So, what this is saying is basically uh, of all of all the possible VLs only the ones which is relevant is L equals 1. Okay. So, uh, so now you have to go ahead and solve this uh, this equation and, uh, and you will see that uh, this equation has a, uh, as a solution. I mean the basically if you make a substitution of r dash is 1 by q dash. So, think of 1 by r dash as your independent variable rather than r dash. You will see that uh, basically that uh, this v v 1 theta is a polynomial in 1 by r dash. Okay. And uh, so, so, you can find out what that polynomial is and uh, you will be able to convince yourself that it is in fact this. So, I know that I am kind of uh, you see uh, this course is somewhat unusual in the sense that it is parts of it especially the Stokes drag calculation is fairly technical and uh, it is not typical of the rest of the course. So, do not want you to get intimidated by uh, this discussion in the sense that not all parts of the course are going to be this technical and involved. It is only this uh, calculation of strokes drags that is uh, difficult. So, I am not going to uh, necessarily insist that you appreciate all aspects of this calculation unless you really want to. And I also do not want to uh, burden you with asking these types of question in any examination. Because this is only meant as a reference for you to uh, you know go back to whenever if somebody uh, if you yourself was wondering where that uh, high school formula comes from and uh, you really were curious to know how to derive it and I just wanted to put it out there and so that you will you will uh, you will know that there is such a derivation and you will feel satisfied that somebody has told you how to derive it. So, it does not necessarily mean that uh, you should kind of know it inside out unless you want to specialize in fluid mechanics. So, um, so this is just merely meant to uh, you know make you aware of the existence of this derivation and the salient uh, step uh, features 
uh, and how the main uh, procedure for deriving that formula. Okay, so, having said that you see uh, we can continue and say that look uh, we wrote down the solution for that uh, V L theta and we, we just convinced ourselves that only L equals 1 contributes and the answer to V 1 theta is basically a polynomial in 1 by R dash. So, having assigned that that polynomial is going to be precisely this, in, in fact you can rather than deriving this you can go ahead and uh, substitute this in uh, this uh, answer here and you will see it is an identity. In fact, think of that as an exercise. So, rather than going through all those steps in a very systematic way, you could uh, you know uh, take some, a lot of it on faith and randomly verify cross check whether some of these things make sense by you know back substitution like this. You substitute 4.199 into 4.198 and convince yourself that it is an identity. So, the point is that uh, you will see that this choice uh, is consistent with the idea that at, uh, at infinity if r equals infinity the velocity of the fluid should be what it was uh, all along when that ball was not there which is u vector ok. So, in the u in the z direction. So, and in fact that is what you see here from, uh, from this. So, now you see this is in some kind of a polar form, if you really want it back in Cartesian form you can go ahead and uh, bring it back to the Cartesian form and the Cartesian form for the velocity would look like this ok. So, that means when r equals infinity uh, all these terms drop out and you only get u k hat ok. So, that uh, at far away situations far away from the sphere. So, uh, r equal to a is the sphere ok, r much greater than a is far away from the sphere. So, if r, r tends to infinity, so you can convince yourself that the velocity is u times k hat ok. So, this is going to tell you exactly what is the velocity field that means, uh, the velocity of the fluid as it flows around the sphere. So, this is so, it is quite nice to know that you can explicitly write down such a formula. So, if there is a sphere sitting here. So, you can even if you do not follow that derivation fully or not at all, you should certainly appreciate the final answer here. So, there is a sphere sitting here with radius a and there is a fluid flowing with velocity u. So, it is it comes from infinity uh, in the k direction with velocity with speed u and goes around the sphere and then again you know flows away to infinity with the with the same speed far away. So, uh, far away on the left side the speed was u, far away on the right side the speed was u. So, the question is what does the speed look like near the sphere and the answer is this. It is really nice to know that you can write down such an answer ok. So, the thing is that uh, so, now what we want to know is that um, the uh, we also want to know what is the force acting on the sphere because of this fluid and the force acting clearly is due to two parts. One is so the force acting per unit volume uh, at any point r in the fluid is uh, due to two parts. One is due to the pressure gradient. So, minus uh, grad p and the other is basically the internal viscosity. So, one layer is rubbing against another layer. So, that also causes a force to act uh, at a point in the fluid because layers are rubbing against each other. So, there is one uh, contribution due to pressure gradient, the other contribution is basically due to the viscosity. So, so now what we really want to do is we want to calculate the uh, z component of the net force acting on the sphere. So, what we have to do is we have to uh, calculate so this force per unit volume. So, you integrate over the volume of that small sphere of radius r. So, so that will tell you the net force acting on this uh, on, on the sphere. So, it is force per unit volume then you integrate over the volume. 
so this will be the net force and then you can re-express this in terms of the uh, surface integral on the surface of the sphere and you will see that uh, this has the familiar interpretation of a kind of some kind of a stress tensor. So, you have a matrix here uh, which is of that form and uh, ok. So, this is the jth component of that. So, so this is itself a component and then there is a grad which has another component. So, in some sense that is a matrix. So, that matrix dotted with the normal component is still a vector. So, bottom line this tells you the jth component of the total force acting on the sphere and we expect only uh, the uh, z component of this force to survive that means j equal to z is the only one which survives because uh, we expect the force to be along the z direction. So, you see uh, because of that uh, Navier-Stokes uh, Reynolds numbers expansion we have this relation. So, now so now what we want to do is we see we got V from V we want to get P. So, after we get P we substitute here because now P and V are related because uh, we can restore the dimensional quantities in that uh, Reynolds number expansion formula which tells you how P is related to V. So, from here you can conclude that P has to have this form ok and uh, because V has this form and uh, you compare both you will see that this constant is, uh, is perfectly determined like this ok. So, it is uh, explicitly determined. So, now you have an explicit formula for the pressure acting in the fluid and also the velocity uh, of the fluid ok. So, now you can go ahead and calculate the net force acting in the z direction and that is basically you just put j equal to z and that is what there is. Ok, so and then you go ahead and calculate that integral and uh, you will find that uh, this is nothing but, so this is uh, d a would be what? So, it, it will be uh, a square d omega right. Uh, so, uh, so that is your uh, surface, surface area, I mean there is the surface area element a square d omega, d omega is a solid angle sin theta d theta d phi but phi integral is 2 pi and sin theta d theta is basically d cos theta and then you integrate and you will get this answer ok. So, this is the Stokes drag yeah so it is a lot of work it is a tremendous amount of work to get a formula that uh, you already know from your high school days. But uh, I just wanted to point out that um, certain results which you are forced to memorize are actually very deep and uh, they come about for very deep reasons and this is one of them ok. Uh, so, so you might be wondering uh, you know this is too much uh, and this is too much effort it is too technical is there a simpler way of getting this. So, that is what I have said in this last paragraph uh, you can in fact many of the books that uh, get this result through a derivation actually do not go through all these steps explicitly. They reduce the number of steps by making some assumptions which they finally do not justify properly. So, it is just that the reader has to kind of again believe some of those statements. So, if you are going to believe some of those statements then you might as well believe this itself. So, why bother trying to go through some steps where a lot of them are again things you have to memorize without proof. So, you might as well memorize this without proof. So, um, so that is the reason why I did not want to do that initially. So, I have spelled out all the steps that are involved in deriving Stokes track. But however, it is still worthwhile to see if now that we at least know we have some confidence that you can explicitly derive some formula if you wanted to. So, it is de desirable to see if uh, there is another version of this calculation which uses fewer steps. So, in fact, uh, there is such a version and I am going to use that to calculate Stokes strike not on a sphere, but on a cylinder. So, you have the same problem and you have this infinitely long cylinder ok and uh, and there is some kind of uh, fluid that is flowing past the cylinder ok. So, uh, 
so you see in, in this situation so you see this is the cross section of the this is the cross section of the cylinder and uh, so there is a infinitely long cylinder and there is fluid flowing past this and clearly it's the fluid is going to drag this uh, sphere around uh, as it goes around this. So, uh, so this is a cylindrical problem is cylindrical symmetry rather than spherical symmetry. So, the simplification so these are the standard uh, starting equations uh, this will this is because of uh, the Reynolds number expansion with the units restored and this is the due to the incompressible fluid and uh, there is this relation. So, we have to combine these two so we have to solve these two with this uh, additional assumptions. So, the question is you know uh, so we did a very systematic for the case of the sphere we actually did a very systematic job of solving this by expanding in powers of uh, uh, you know the basis functions and all that. So, if you did not want to do that you have to simplify things further by uh, making some answers. So, this is an uh, simplifying assumption that we say that uh, this pressure is expressible uh, in in terms of the position vector in this way. So, that is exactly why I am saying that uh, it is kind of uh, not very convincing. So, most of the books uh, actually start something uh, you know they they make some statements like this and then they proceed and that uh, simplifies the equations a lot you get your final answers very quickly but it is not at all clear why this should be the case. But at the same time uh, it is uh, it's not that unreasonable because after all you see the, the pressure yeah so basically what this is saying is exactly what I actually derived. So, what this is saying is that it only involves cos theta it does not involve cos square theta or anything any higher power. So, what this is is just uh, cos theta it is u dot r is basically u r cos theta. So, it, it automatically assumes that p is uh, proportional to p 1 cos theta p 1 cos theta is just cos theta. So, I in the case of the sphere I actually derived that I showed that all higher uh, l's do not contribute only the l equal to 1 contributes whereas, here it is kind of uh, assumed that that is the case. And if you of course, assume that that is the case you can necessarily uh, it is true that you can simplify this a lot and uh, this thing gets simplified very quickly and as usual you express your radial in terms of the angular and then you go ahead and uh, uh, rewrite yeah it is still long, but, uh, but you can go ahead and in the case of cylindrical you get these two components in terms of the coefficients. So, then you can go ahead and uh, so, so, in the case of the cylindrical term there are some uh, peculiarities which are not there for the sphere. For example, you get this log term. So, this log term uh, becomes uh, unstable when r is very large. So, uh, the basically the reason for this log term uh, is because we have ignored the convective derivatives. So, in fact, Osin uh, who is a researcher in this field has pointed out that if you include the convective derivative then you get some sensible terms even at r. So, at r equal to infinity these these, uh, these equations do not uh, converge to what we expect because of this log term. So, what we have to assume is that uh, what Osin has shown is that uh, basically when uh, you include the convective derivative. Uh, r equals infinity effectively becomes some r equals r infinity which is some very large uh, term. So, that uh, so I mean I am just being sloppy here. So, what, what basically it means is that you can get away by writing log r, but uh, because you have ignored the convective derivative you, you should not you are not entitled to set us uh, lower case r equals infinity you are only allowed to go up to r some large value of r which is r subscript infinity. So, that uh, serves as a proxy for a uh, small r being infinity. So, the bottom line is that uh, when this is the case uh, you expect this to be you know u, u theta and so on. So, that is that is the way the c's are determined. So, the c's are determined by forcing uh, v phi and v r to be 
these two known values, but not at r equal to infinity, but its its proxy value which is r equals r capital R subscript infinity, which is uh, large, but not actually infinite. But then uh, also of course, uh, uh, the velocity should vanish uh, on the surface of the sphere because kind of there is no slippage condition. So, the cylinder is stationary, so the fluid should be stationary along with the sphere when they are touching. So, from that you can uh, fix the remaining coefficients. So, so all these coefficients get fixed uh, by these two requirements and the only thing is that you will have to live with this peculiar um, proxy for infinite uh, distance which is r subscript infinity ok. Um, so, but then uh, you will see that uh, that finally drops out of your calculation for the drag. So, you will get an answer for the velocity and therefore, from the earlier result from the pressure also if you know the velocity you can get pressure because you have that uh, grad p equals eta del squared v. So, if you know velocity you can solve this and get pressure but all of them will involve this r infinity, but then later you will see that uh, when you actually evaluate the drag that uh, yeah, so it, it will appear in the, this form, it will involve uh, r infinity as a multiplicative constant ok. So, it will come out as this and dimensionally also the um, viscosity in two dimensions is kind of uh, different from. Uh, what it is in uh, case of three dimensions. So, these are two dimensional because it is cylindrical symmetry the z does not play a role ok. So, it is kind of uh, I mean the z is along the cylinder. So, along the cylinder does not play a role. So, it is effectively a two dimensional problem, but uh, bottom line is that this uh, this proxy for infinite distance Osin has shown that if you properly study this by including the uh, convective derivative, uh, this proxy for infinite distance uh, of course, also in dimensionless units uh, will be something which is inversely proportional to the Reynolds number. So, remember that all this uh, analysis is valid for low Reynolds number. So, we are expanding powers of the Reynolds number. So, therefore, this r infinity which is according to Osin 7.4 by Reynolds number. So, bottom line is when r uh, Reynolds number is small which is the regime in which this is valid, this proxy for infinity actually is uh, divergent which is what we expect. All right, so, um, so you, you get a uh, less familiar formula for the Stokes drag of a cylinder uh, placed in a moving fluid. So, this is not what you learn in high school because it has this peculiar thing that Reynolds number is involved, but for sphere that drops out uh, to lowest order, which is why you learn it in school ok. Um, so, I have come to the end of uh, fluid mechanics and elasticity theory. So, in the next class I am going to explain uh, you know how to motivate the introduction of quantum fields. So, till now all we have, all we have studied there is no mention of quantum mechanics anywhere. So, it is all classical. So, in from the next class onwards I will explain to you um, how it is that many of these concepts which involve uh, infinitely many continuous degrees of freedom for of classical systems can now be studied quantum mechanically. So, if there are point particles you know how to study uh, you know how to go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, but if you have uh, infinitely many particles uh, infinitely many classical degrees of freedom and if that infinity is of the continuous kind making it a field. So, it becomes important for us to know uh, what it is we are expected to do in order to study that quantum mechanically. So, of the um, the most important of these applications would be to study uh, the uh, Maxwell's uh, study Maxwell's equations uh, quantum mechanically. So, that means, uh, so if, if you look at empty space 
electromagnetic fields uh, cause electromagnetic waves which are classical. But then if you study electromagnetic fields quantum mechanically, you do not get electromagnetic waves, you get uh, quanta of energy. So, basically you get uh, discrete uh, energies and these are called photons. So, this would be a first rigorous demonstration of the fact that radiation is actually made of quanta and this is was famously demonstrated or uh, realized by Einstein in his theory of photoelectric effect. So, which we all learn in school. So, so photoelectric effect uh, simply cannot be explained if you uh, posit that electromagnetic fields are classical waves. So, it can only be explained by invoking the quantum theory of the electromagnetic field or uh, quantum theory of radiation. So, the question is uh, what is the logical justification for a quantum theory of radiation and that is basically involves studying the equations of electric and magnetic fields, Maxwell's equations not classically, but quantum mechanically. So, that is going to be our uh, important goal in the next few lectures. So, I hope you will join me for that uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you.